You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of what I uh, will say about Augustine the preacher, a number of you will have, will have heard in some context, right? Because in the, in the History and Doctrine sequence, where we discuss uh, not only uh, Augustine the preacher, but we read a lot of Augustine's, well, a handful of Augustine's sermons. Uh, and uh, if you've done an Augustine seminar with me, we, uh, we again think about uh, Augustine's preaching and, uh, and what he's doing. Most of what I'm going to say, I, I just went through and I kind of culled observations from Augustine uh, in his, his book, Teaching Christianity. Uh, I don't typically assign this. It's an excellent book, though. Uh, and a lot of what I'll say will be drawn from book four, where Augustine is offering really practical advice on how he thinks of preaching, uh, what you need to know, how you ought to do it, and some of the, uh, the concerns that you ought to have. It's overwhelming. Augustine's description of what makes for a great preacher is probably something that exceeds all of us. And Augustine even says at the end, I don't live up to that standard either. Uh, and yet these are the things that we, uh, we ought to be doing. Uh, one of the things, if you read, uh, we have a lot of his sermons, right? And it's, it's just a tiny fraction of his sermons that, uh, that remain. One big footnote that I should put on this, uh, if you do, and I encourage you to look at Augustine's sermons, there's different kinds of sermons that we have from Augustine. Uh, so the advice I'm going to give is going to, you know, it's going to depend on the kind of sermon we're talking about. Uh, Augustine is typically preaching to the people, so his sermons to the people, uh, especially in Hippo, his own home congregation. If you read through these sermons, you begin to get a sense of Augustine's personality, his interaction with those in Hippo. He preaches differently to his own people. Uh, and you can pick up on this. There's a real familiarity uh, with his home congregation. He does not, uh, he does not try to overwhelm them in those sermons. But Augustine, if you have a sense of the geography here, he's in North Africa, Hippo is a port town, it's a smaller town, and the big city is Carthage. That's where the bishop is, that's where the library is. Augustine goes to Carthage regularly, and he's preaching in Carthage. So now he's preaching uh, at a more elevated audience, and you can again see in his sermons that he's doing that. Uh, he preaches a lot to catechumens, one of the things I love about Augustine is that he's this great bishop, he's this phenomenal theologian, and we have many, many sermons from him devoted to those who are learning about the faith, learning about the basics of the faith. And in those catechetical sermons, he's typically taking you through the Apostles' Creed or the Creed from Hippo, uh, likely that, uh, that he's using, but it looks like the Apostles' Creed is what uh, he's using. Instructs in basic things like baptism and the Lord's Supper. Another set of sermons that we have from Augustine would be as we think of continuous preaching through books of the Bible. Uh, we have his sermons on the Psalms. Uh, it's his largest work. If we can think of it as a single work, it would be his largest uh, work. He sometimes has multiple sermons on a particular Psalm. He also preaches through the Gospel of John. Uh, but one thing that you need to understand about Augustine in any of his works, and especially in his preaching works, when we begin to assemble them and we think about, oh, this is Augustine's commentary on John. This is actually a good one to illustrate this. Augustine often takes a very long time to write any work. Uh, and it, it really is mind-blowing when you think about it. Augustine began his commentary on John as an example to illustrate this. He began that commentary uh, no sooner than, uh, than December of 406. And it, he either began December 406 or 407. He preaches through, uh, there's 124 tractates, I think, for the Gospel of John. So in other words, he uses 124 sermons to get through the whole Gospel. Basically preaches through the whole Gospel, not the entire thing, but he misses a few verses here or there. But he begins in 406. He then stops uh, in 408, and he doesn't pick up again until... Uh, either 414 or 416. That's a big gap, right? And then he gets closer to 420, and he's like, I got to finish this thing, right? Uh, and so he seems to have dictated the final sermons in this collection. They were never actually delivered before a congregation. 
but he dictated them so that they could be delivered. And in many cases, they were preached by other people uh, in, uh, in Carthage. All of that to say, when we talk about Augustine the preacher and Augustine's sermons, there's a host of different types of preaching that we have to consider uh, from Augustine. Let me start in this way, though, uh, before I dive into sort of his advice and his description on what a preacher is and what a preacher should do. The context for Augustine's preaching, and I think this is across the board for patristic preaching, in other words, what are you doing and why are you doing it? It's pastoral care. Uh, in the Cappadocians class, we just uh, talked about Gregory of Nazianzus, or we are talking about Gregory's preaching. And Gregory has this in one of his uh, sermons, and so this isn't Augustine, but I think it captures well what Augustine would be thinking. That when we think of the context of preaching, we are seeing here those who have been called to preach, but also those who have been called to be preached to. Or as Gregory of Nazianzus puts it, those who are called to feed and those who are called to be fed, those who are called to lead and those who are called to be led. It's that dynamic that is up in play, especially for Augustine, that as the one called to preach and to instruct and therefore to care for and shepherd those before him, well, those before him, those baptized before him, have also been called to be shepherded and instructed by Augustine. One of the fascinating things that uh, you see uh, in Augustine's various writings is the way he talks about and reflects upon his congregation. And if you are baptized in Augustine's understanding, you have given yourself over to the care of the church. Now, if you, uh, if you decide to wander from the faith, Augustine, in Augustine's mind, you, don't, you no longer have that right because you've yielded that right to the church in baptism, and Augustine will therefore pursue you and continue to seek you out to bring you back in to the church. It's that dynamic that's at play here. So this isn't just Augustine preaching to deliver information uh, to a particular group of people, some of whom may be his congregation, but often probably mixed. It's not that for Augustine. It's Augustine, the shepherd, who seeks to care for the people entrusted to him, and a principal way in which he does that is through preaching. So if, you can't, if you're not thinking of preaching as pastoral care, you're not really thinking of patristic preaching. Uh, it is how I can care for your soul, how I can, at times, if I need to, to rebuke, at other times to encourage, and then, of course, the host of different ways in which we all need that and the difficulty of doing that, given the diversity of, of the audience that we have. So here I have some quotes for you. Uh, we've, this, I'm going to give you two quotes from Augustine, the, the young preacher. Uh, now, Augustine's ordained in 391, so he's, he's almost 40 years old. He's in his late 30s uh, when he's uh, ordained priest. Uh, and he's only a priest for a few years before, before he becomes a bishop. But early on, after his ordination, he reflects on what it means to be a, uh, to be a priest. And it's not going to surprise you. He says a priest is one who administers the sacrament and the word of God to the people. And then he puts it a slightly different way. Uh, he says a priest is one who bears the difficult burden of speaking God's truth. Now think about that. I think those two things are really important, that Augustine is not going to reduce what it means for him to be a priest merely to the preaching. That's very significant, but it, it's more than that. It's also administration of sacraments. It's also uh, the way in which he cares for, as a priest, the people with all of uh, the gifts of God, we might put it. But then note the second thing that he says here. It's to bear the difficult burden of speaking God's truth. This point will become very clear when I read some other things to you from Augustine. One of the difficulties of preaching, and yet also one of the, uh, uh, the great, uh, how do I want to put it, one of the reasons why preaching is actually not that hard is that you're not preaching yourself. You're not preaching your truth. You're preaching God's truth. Therefore, you don't have to come up with what to say. You already have what you say. But the difficult burden of it is, this is what you have to say. And therefore, you have to preach God's truth as it is and as it is given to you in the full weight of that truth. And that's a burden for Augustine. It's a burden because everybody 
hears and learns differently, and he has to find a way of conveying then that truth to all who are in front of him. Well, how about Augustine as a very seasoned preacher? Uh, Augustine lives into his 70s, and he's preaching all the way uh, to the end. So here are some comments that he makes uh, toward the end of life. Uh, he says that uh, we are ministers of the word. Oh, actually, this makes the point I was just getting at. He says, we are ministers of the word, not our word, but God's word. That's what it means to preach. That's what it means to minister, is that you become, in a sense, an instrument used by God to deliver his gifts to his people. But then he reflects on what it means to be a preacher, and now he's got this whole list of things. And listen to some of these things. Uh, preachers must, you have to do all of these, you must interpret and teach divine scripture. You must defend the right faith. You must teach everything that is good. You must unteach all that is evil. So it's not just teaching, it's unteaching. You win over those hostile to the truth. And you also have to rouse the smug and the indifferent. You have to teach both the learned and the ignorant, which means that you must know both how and when to instruct, implore, rebuke, stir, check, and all of these different things require different, as he puts it, rhetorical styles. And that's ultimately, that quote actually comes from teaching Christianity. Uh, this is another example of a work he started in the 390s. And then he started reviewing all of his works toward the end of life, and he's like, oh, I guess I didn't finish it. Let's finish that now. And so he finishes it at the end. So all of book four is actually the seasoned uh, bishop that's reflecting on uh, what it means to, uh, to preach. Okay, so what does he say? Now, most of what I'm going to share with you here comes out of uh, teaching Christianity. Uh, what are sermons for Augustine? You know, what exactly is a sermon? Uh, he has a nice way of putting this. Uh, he says that sermons are books read by those who cannot read, right? So the sermon becomes the very vehicle of conveying information to those who cannot get that information in any other way. Uh, you know, I don't know if we face that same burden in exactly the same way that Augustine did uh, in his day, but I do think we face it in another way. It's not, it's not that we uh, have illiterate people, per se, we just have illiterate people when it comes to the scriptures. Right? I mean, they, they could read the scriptures, they just don't. And so what you preach, as Augustine is saying here, you become, in a sense, the book that's available to them. You become the scriptures available to them, especially if they're not reading or studying that on their own. Now, here's an image that he uses. Uh, I love this image. I shared this with my wife, and I'll tell you what, she puts a nice footnote on this. He says that sermons are like a banquet like a banquet. Now, I'm Lutheran, right? And Lutherans are really weird about potlucks in a bad way. And so my wife is like, so it's not a potluck. And I was thinking to myself, you know, it's actually not a potluck. That's not what he's getting at, because it's not about what we can all bring to the table. This is a banquet, and God is the one serving us. And so he goes on to say, it is God that serves us his goods, uh, but preaching, because it is like a banquet, it's kind of like, and the analogy he uses here is feeding, that feeding and listening are sort of similar. Uh, and he says that as God delivers his goods through the preacher, it's often important for the preacher to recognize that people are often fussy. They're fussy in their eating. And so he says when people are fussy in their eating, sometimes, and this is his line, sometimes you need pickles and spices. And he's using this as an analogy to think about preaching that sometimes you have to know how to add spice to what you say, give them some pickles, uh, give them some spices, help them out. Uh, we'll, think, we'll, we'll talk more about what he means by adding seasoning and spice to, uh, to a sermon. Okay, if that's what the sermon is, it's kind of a banquet, you're feeding them with God's, uh, God's word. What must you do if you're going to preach well? What must you do if you're going to preach well? This is a rather famous uh, line by Augustine, so maybe you've heard it. Uh, he says here in book four uh, that you must first be a prayer to be a preacher. That if you're going to preach, again, what you preach is not your own. What you preach is God's word, not your word. Uh, 
And therefore, because it is God's word, you need to begin with prayer that God would give you the words for your discourse and for your, your sermon. And so this is a quote from him. He says, you should pray that God may put good words in your mouth. So all <laughs> preaching must begin with prayer. If we ask Augustine, what must I know to preach well? I know that I must pray before I preach, but what must I know to come to the actual task of preaching? Well, here's his list, and it's basically everything. Uh, the first thing that you must do is memorize the whole Bible. Now, I, I always chuckle over this, and, it's a, and you find that the church fathers say this kind of thing all the time. Well, if you want to preach, then you have to actually know the Bible. Uh, and you have to understand the Bible, not just know the Bible. And in that sense, you have to have the Bible memorized. But he also gives some more practical advice. And listen to how similar this sounds to what you all are doing. He says, compare manuscripts. Now, what he's talking about is especially comparing the old Latin manuscripts that would have been available. See the different ways. So we might, we might say compare translations, English translations, to see different ways of putting uh, the, uh, the text. Now, for Augustine, this is maybe, you're probably not learning this in your Bible classes, but uh, for Augustine, he says, you know, use the Septuagint to clarify and deepen the Hebrew, especially the Old Testament he's thinking of here. For Augustine, both are inspired and both inform uh, our faith. Uh, learn languages if you can. Uh, something that, uh, I mean, Augustine doesn't know Hebrew. Uh, the older he gets, the more Greek he knows. And, and I'm of the opinion that he knows more Greek than most people uh, uh, assume. Uh, he's offering translations, by the way, toward the end of his life of, uh, of the Cappadocians, and that's not easy Greek. So uh, uh, he's at least uh, capable of doing that toward the end of his life. You also need to study secular subjects. You need to know history, you need to know philosophy, we're not surprised by any of that. But he also says you need to know mathematics. You know why you need to know mathematics when reading the Bible? Because there's lots of numbers in the Bible. And you need to understand the patterns of numbers, especially if you're going to give an allegorical interpretation of the numbers in Scripture. You need to know your math. Uh, so ultimately he says, you know, plunder the Egyptians, take advantage uh, of all the resources available to you so that you can rightly preach and open up uh, God's Word. Uh, the last thing he says on this point, and this goes back to the issue of memorizing, a good preacher, he says, is one who can frequently quote from Scripture, not simply paraphrasing, but actually quoting from Scripture to make your point. And he says you should have these at your fingertips that you should have those texts available to you. Uh, let, me, let me pause there for just a second. I, I'm going to eventually get to how Augustine actually preaches. Uh, and one of the things that uh, is true with Augustine is uh, he doesn't manuscript his sermons, and I'm going to tell you why he doesn't do that. Uh, but that doesn't mean he's not preparing, right? It's not that Augustine just gets up, though I've got an example of that too. Uh, it's not that Augustine just stands up and starts preaching. He's put a great deal of preparation into the sermon, but it's not manuscripted. Uh, it's the stenographers taking it down, especially the sermons to the people that likely indicate really how Augustine was preaching. You know, in the, in the Cappadocians class, we're reading homilies by the Cappadocians, but those are so polished. They were never given in that form. We have a lot of sermons from Augustine that really do reflect what likely happened. Uh, and what, what people were likely hearing. But he's memorizing Scripture, of course, and he's using that in his preaching, even though he's not manuscripting the sermon uh, itself. Okay, well, if those are the subjects I need to know, what else do I need to understand uh, as, a, uh, as a good preacher? Uh, and the big thing for Augustine is you have to know your audience, you have to know what you are to say, and you have to know how best to say it. And what he's getting at there is it's a mixed audience. And this is true of our churches. It's true of his churches. You have learned and unlearned. You have insiders and outsiders. It's often a mixed uh, group in the uh, early church. For a lot of sermons, it's a mixed uh, group. And this is why he says you don't manuscript your sermon. Uh, it's, you don't manuscript your sermon because if you did, uh, and incidentally, I only know of one 
like really good example from the early church of a, a person that was known to manuscript their sermons uh, and then put them to memory, to memorize them, and they're being criticized. Uh, just about all the sermons we're aware of were not manuscripted. Now, why is that? Uh, and this is the reason. You have to be able to respond to your audience. So for Augustine, uh, this is the best way for me to describe it. He's prepared to preach. He's probably got a whole host of scriptures memorized. He knows the sort of direction he's going to go, and he knows the points that he's going to make. But it's kind of like a football game, right, where you get up there and you're reading the defense, and sometimes you need to call an audible, right? Sometimes you see that the defense has aligned in such a way that you need to change course. Augustine does this. The stenographers record this. We know this is happening. So if you read Augustine's sermons, it's typically a very rowdy crowd. Uh, people are, they're loud, they clap, uh, they cheer, they jeer. And the stenographers often are, are saying, the crowd is saying this, or the crowd is clapping, right? Um, we don't have a lot of examples of that, but we do have some examples. Well, one of the things that you typically see in Augustine's preaching is he will pause to comment on his congregation. And he'll say things like, I see you didn't like that. I see that you, you didn't like what I just said. And so Augustine will go right back to the point and really drive it home. Or he'll say, okay, I see that you've had enough. Or he'll say, oh, I see that you, uh, you delighted in how I said that, but did you delight in what I said? Right? So this is, this is of course, you know, just this is classical culture that they do delight in words. Uh, and the rhetorical culture of Augustine's day is, is thriving on how you use words, which is in part why it's such a mixed uh, congregation uh, at time. But he doesn't manuscript the sermon because there is a sense in which the sermon is interactive for him. There's a, there's a number of sermons where you can see that he'll get to the end and he'll simply say, I can see that it, this is enough for today. So we'll pick up here uh, next time. And then he'll start the next sermon and he'll say, I owe a debt to you because God gave us a text. He always refers to it in that way. The text being preached upon is what God has given the church to be preached upon. And therefore, if he doesn't pay his debt by preaching on that text, he owes the congregation. And he'll come back to that then uh, the next day. You see this especially uh, in the continuous series. So like the Gospel of John, uh, you'll see that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, I skipped a little bit. Oh, here we go. Uh, right. So as you're preaching, you've got to know your audience. You've got to know how to say it. And for Augustine, then, you especially can never be dull. If you're dull, you're doing a disservice to the Word. This is God's truth. And if you're not keeping the attention and interest of the congregation, then you're not actually preaching the Word in the way it needs to be preached. But you should also not be too entertaining for the sake of being entertaining. Uh, and this is where he has these great lines uh, that you need to love more the truth that you say than how you say it. You need to love more uh, the substance of what you're preaching than the words used to preach that substance. Uh, and that's Augustine's way of actually acknowledging both, right? You can't be dull. You can't be boring. You do have to spice it up. You do need some pickles once in a while, um, but it can't just be pickles and spices, Right? It can't simply be for the entertainment of the congregation because then you're not actually doing uh, what God has, uh, has called you to do. What if you're not eloquent? Right? Augustine's eloquent. Augustine's one of the greatest rhetors in the, in the history of the church. So if you're not like Augustine, how do you do some of these things? And Augustine says, your eloquence is your wisdom, and your wisdom is God's word, and therefore your eloquence is God's word. If you wish to be eloquent in your preaching, then saturate your preaching with Scripture. One last thing on this point. Here's another very famous line uh, that you maybe have heard from Augustine. It's all, again, on this issue of eloquence. Uh, and he says, never use, this is a great line, never use a golden key when a wooden key will do. Have you heard that before? That often gets repeated from Augustine. So in other words, uh, if you don't need to be extravagant with your language. If you don't need to, you know, have incredible flourishes with you, then don't do it, right? Uh, and the, I don't, I have this line somewhere. Uh, he says, remember that 
your words serve you, you don't serve your words. And it's again, it's this idea of don't fall in love with what you say or with, with how you say it, love rather what it is uh, that you're saying. Here's going to be a surprise to you. Because you have to know your audience, you have to know the limits of your audience. And so Augustine says, if that means that you should use bad grammar, then you should use bad grammar. If bad grammar will make the point so that they understand it, then that's how you ought to speak to them. If you try to speak in a way that, you know, I don't know the example here, maybe it's, you know, you're using whom in the right way or something, and, or you're using the subjunctive were, and this is confusing to the, then it's like, well, why would you do that, right? The, the point is to convey God's truth and God's word, and you must convey it as your audience will understand it. So if this is not, you know, when he's in Carthage, when he's surrounded by a very learned audience, well, Augustine's going to speak in a learned way. Uh, in fact, there's a, there's a, there's a sermon uh, that he gives after Christmas one year where he's in Carthage, and they're gathered, uh, they're gathered for, to celebrate the, uh, the bishop's anniversary, and he offers them a sermon as a, uh, my Cappadocian students are going to recognize this because he's actually reading, I think, Gregory's oration. He offers his own feast, and it becomes his banquet uh, that he can give them as a gift. And so it's very rhetorical, it's very beautiful, but it's Augustine being very playful in a way that he would never do if he were in Hippo or in one of the other smaller towns uh, in his diocese. Um, one last thing on the, on the audience bit. Uh, for Augustine, because you have to know your audience and sermons don't afford questions, even though they're rather rowdy, they don't get to ask any questions. He says a good preacher will anticipate questions by incorporating them into the sermon itself. So in other words, and you see this all the time with Augustine, his sermons are full of dialogue, and he takes on, he's, he's acting as if he's a person in the congregation asking the question that they really would want to ask, uh, and he gives it voice, and then he answers it for them. Uh, or he'll take a question that they would be embarrassed to ask, and he'll put it in the mouth of a heretic, that's why they're embarrassed to ask it, uh, and then he will respond and show how you, you, uh, you resolve that, that difficulty. So for Augustine, questions become a big part uh, of his, uh, his preaching and the things that he's, he's doing. Um, okay, if I had to break it down to Augustine preaching 101, what, like, what is his advice uh, on how you, 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 you preach uh, any sermon? The first thing, we've talked enough about this, that you have to understand the balance between being boring uh, and being merely entertaining. That you've got to find that balance, and that's, again, knowing your audience. And here he, he borrows from Cicero. Uh, he tweaks Cicero just a little bit, but he borrows uh, advice from Cicero to explain a sermon. That a sermon always has three points to it for Augustine, uh, or three parts, let me put it that way. One is to teach, right? That's the whole purpose of the sermon, is to instruct and to teach God's Word. And you teach in order to persuade, that's the goal, that people would believe uh, what you're saying is true, and you do that by delighting the audience. So it's to teach, it's to delight in order to persuade. Now, of course, Augustine then talks a lot about this, that we have to be careful with the delight part because you don't want to get lost in the delighting at the expense of the actual teaching and persuading. The whole purpose is to, again, persuade of the truth. But to do that well, you have to delight them. You have to, you have to keep them interested uh, in what you're doing. And one of the ways in which he does that, I think, is this Q&A that he often does. Another classic device that Augustine uses is he will begin a sermon by sort of stating the faith of the church. Well, we believe this. And we all believe this. And they're like, yeah, yeah, they're assenting. But then he'll, he'll look to the scriptures and say, but it sure looks like the Bible is disagreeing with that. It sure looks like the Bible is saying that that's not what we should believe. Well, if you're in the audience, you're immediately interested in this because now you're like, oh, does it? <laughs> well, I'm glad you're going to answer this question then, right? And that's what he, he'll, I call it, he backs himself into a corner and then you're interested. And then quite honestly, he'll do it again. And now you're very interested, and now you're thinking, can Augustine get out of this? And that's what he actually does. He'll get out of it exegetically, and then toward the end of the sermon, he'll say, uh, you didn't think we could get out of this, but it, once again, we see the, uh, 
the faith of the church in answering uh, these, uh, these questions. Okay, so you got a balance between being boring and, and being entertaining. You use this insight from, uh, from Cicero, but you must always bear in mind these final two things he'll say. One is that preaching is such a great matter because everything that you say concerns heaven and hell. That's why it's so important and so significant. And then the last thing that he says here, uh, actually there's two more things. Second to the last thing he says here is that a preacher's lifestyle carries more weight than his oratory. In other words, be more interested in how you live according to the substance of what you're preaching than once again being caught up in how you're saying it uh, and the words that you're using. But here's the last thing, and I bet this is going to surprise you. Augustine says, if you cannot preach a good sermon, then take someone else's sermon and preach that. Now, this is, this is, of course, a big issue in our own day. People talk about this. Why would Augustine say that? Well, it goes back to what we said earlier, because the sermon isn't yours, right? The truth, the substance of what you're preaching, it isn't yours. That's God's truth. It's not your truth. So since you're preaching God's truth, if you're not capable of doing this uh, in a satisfactory way, Augustine encourages you to then borrow someone else's sermon. This is part of the reason that you have Augustine and others dictating so many sermons that can then be used elsewhere. So Augustine gets requests all the time. Uh, you said you were going to dictate some sermons and send them, and you haven't done that. And he's like, ah, okay. And so that's, that's actually what he does. Is he's, he, there's not a congregation in front of him. Uh, there's merely a few brothers and stenographers there, and he's, he's dictating it. And this is what's fascinating, by the way. You can see this especially in his, in his tractates on the Gospel of John because we know, you know most of the early ones are all preached, but then the bulk of the, the uh, final ones are all dictated. It's really hard to tell the difference. They're shorter. The dictated ones are shorter uh, than, the, than the preached ones, but it's really hard to tell the difference because Augustine is, for lack of a better way, uh, expression, he's in character. He's in character, he's asking the questions, he's referring to the congregation, even though there's no one there, he's still referring to them, uh, and he's, he's talking to them in a way that he would typically, uh, typically talk. Okay, uh, let me just take a few more minutes and then I'll, 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 I'll give you uh, time to ask me some questions. Um, what about Augustine the preacher? Uh, what do we know about, uh, about him? Well, I've already said a little bit of this, that he's interactive, uh, in terms of what's actually happening, he's going to be seated uh, in an elevated position. You all are going to be standing. Now, he does mention in a couple of his uh, letters that there are some people that sit, but these are likely those who are too weak to stand. You're all going to be standing. He's going to be seated. Well, when I, when I think of that, I immediately then say, okay, how long am I going to be standing, Augustine? <laughs> there, his sermons are all over the place. I mean, you, if you read them, if you were to read them aloud and say, how long is he preaching? We have some sermons, especially some of those catechetical sermons, that probably 10 minutes, right? It's, it's not a lot of time at all. Uh, but then most of them, you know, they're, they're somewhere in the 30, 40 minute range, it looks like to me. His longest sermon, uh, his longest sermon is preached in uh, January, 404 is likely the date, happens to coincide with a pagan feast going on. And Augustine's talking about this in the sermon, and he does not want the people to go to the feast because it's nothing but sin that awaits them. His sermon, it's the longest sermon he has, and it's estimated to be anywhere from two and a half hours to three hours. <laughs> the best description of this is this is Augustine's filibuster. Like, he's not going to stop talking because he doesn't want them to go out to the, uh, to the festival and the, uh, and the feast. But think about that. You're standing. You're standing. And you've got a guy up there preaching that's not afraid to call you out, right? So he's watching all of you. You don't get to sneak off and, and leave the church. You're going to stay, uh, stay right there uh, for him. Um, let's see. Last thing... Uh, um, oh, yeah, here, let me share this with you. I'll, I'll stop with this. I think I've covered just about uh, uh, everything. Uh, 
generally speaking, Augustine is going to, uh, when, when Augustine preaches in church, right, in church when he's preaching, there's a lectionary, unless he's doing the continuous preaching through books during the week. But typically, right, on, uh, uh, on the Lord's Day, he's using a, a lectionary, and this is how it works in Augustine's day. Uh, he, he appoints the psalm. So there's not an appointed psalm. He will pick the psalm that fits the sermon that he wishes to give, which again is another indication he's thought through everything that he's going to say, even if it isn't manuscripted. Well, sometimes it has happened to Augustine that the reader reads the wrong lesson. Listen to Augustine. We, we, have, we have one example where he's talking about this. He says, the reading from the gospel, which we have just he heard, dearly beloved, was not arranged by me. <laughs> As usually happens, he says, as usually happens. So this has happened before. He said, I didn't, I didn't pick that reading. But all the same, thanks to the good management of the Lord who controls all our activities, it fits extremely well with the psalm I appointed. <laughs> so he proceeds to then preach on that text. Now, that's, that's one of the few examples we have where Augustine really did come into the, you know, into the pulpit. There's no pulpit, but he really did then, you know, come to preach uh, on a text that he hadn't prepared, though he clearly saw that it was close enough to what he did prepare, <laughs> he could make it work. Uh, and, you know, the reason for that, of course, is Augustine is just so immersed, I think, in the scriptures, and he's doing this so regularly, right? It's estimated he probably preached around 8,000 sermons, even though we only have about four or five uh, hundred of them. Well, I think I'll stop there to see what questions uh, you have on just sort of broadly Augustine, oh, the preacher. Anyone have a question? Thank you so much. You really uh, brought Augustine to life for us. Um, what else do we know about his actual preparation? You mentioned that he would compare different translations of the text. Was he also looking at maybe earlier fathers and how they had interpreted the text as well? Mm. Boy, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, we know that, uh, and this is, this is one of the questions that I'm really interested in, is I'm, tr I'm very, fa very fascinated by Augustine's sources and, and how we can determine those. But Augustine, like so many church fathers, rarely names his sources. Uh, but Augustine does have a, gr a good comment at the beginning of uh, his De Trinitate, he says, uh, as he prepared to, to write on the Trinity, uh, he did this by reading all of the Catholic commentaries on the Old and New Testament that he could find. Right? Now, I, I love that comment because he's using commentaries to write on the Trinity. That was, that was his instinct. Um, so we do at least have a, a, a comment here that he's, he's reading commentaries. We know that he's reading uh, Ambrose's commentary on Luke. Uh, he, uh, he cites that regularly. Uh, we know he's reading, he has read uh, some of Origen's commentaries that have been translated uh, into Latin, and he's reading uh, Hilary Poitier's commentary uh, on the Psalms. We know that. Um, but in terms of the preparation, you know, one of the things that's interesting about Augustine, uh, and we don't really know the, the resources, the library resources in Hippo, we do know that he's very dependent upon the library resources in Carthage. And so often when he's there, this is where we see a lot of production from him on some of his other works because he has access to the archives uh, in Carthage. This isn't really answering your question in a great way other than to say Augustine is in fact studying and reading closely the, the fathers that went before him on various theological issues and scriptural issues. And one of the, the types of writings that we have from him, fascinating genre that really deserves more attention, uh, Augustine has written a, what he calls a harmony of the Gospels, uh, which is really not a harmonization of them as much as recognizing uh, the differences between them. Well, he's doing that because he's using a, a, a resource that Eusebius of Caesarea uh, developed and that Jerome then attached to his uh, translation of the Gospels. Uh, so here's some scholarly use by him. But we also have a number of works by Augustine about difficult questions from Scripture. One of the last works that he writes, well, toward the end of his life, uh, he writes uh, a series of questions and sayings drawn from the first seven books of, of the Bible. Uh, and again, it's, these are, a lot of these are exegetical puzzles that he wrestles with. 
Now, the reason I bring that up is because in one of them, he mentions Didymus, the blind. So he was using Didymus in some measure on that exegetical work. So all that to say, great question. It's hard to answer with a lot of specifics other than to say, we have a lot of indications that he is doing this. We can't always identify uh, the sources, though, that he's using. Do you know any examples off the top of your mind of some of the pickles and spices that Augustine would have used? Oh, you know, I didn't bring the, uh, I was going to bring another book in here. Um, William Harmless, Augustine in His Own Words, I think is the title of it. It really is an excellent uh, collection uh, of, of excerpts from Augustine's various writings. Highly recommend it. Um, he has a chapter in there, Augustine the Preacher, and he provides examples. Of, some of them are like Latin rap, he calls them, where right, Augustine's just playing with words. Uh, and he does this so often in his preaching. And again, it's, it's a cultural issue, right? It, it was expected that he would do that. It is part of you know, delighting, but also drawing in the, uh, the audience. Uh, so yes, Augustine does this sort of thing uh, fairly regularly. I was wondering if there was anything, this, I'm trying to think of how to formulate the question. Um, in his preparation or his things that ministers ought to prepare for, memorize the whole of scripture. Mm -hmm. Did he have some special way of doing this? Like, or was he just reading or having yeah, it I mean, read aloud? I mean, just about all of Augustine's work is reflecting upon scripture, right? I mean, this is why uh, you see the writings, not just the sermons, but the writings of the church fathers, it, it, they're really saturated with scripture such that scripture becomes their language. And this is because this is the principal thing that they're reading constantly. Uh, I don't know how often Augustine read through the Bible. Luther mentions that he reads through the Bible twice a year, right? It's, it's something that they're constantly doing. They're constantly reading, reflecting upon, engaging in the scriptures, both to teach, but also uh, because of controversy. Uh, and nothing teaches you better than controversy, right? It, it forces, a, I mean, the Pelagian controversy is great because it forces uh, Augustine to really, you know, study the issue of grace, to really go through Paul's letters in a way that he hadn't been doing. And the same with the, you know, the, the Latin Homoians or the Arians of his day. I mean, it sends him on, you know, he rereads the Gospel of John in a sense. So his mature reflections on John are because of controversy. Heretics are also a gift, is the point. <laughs> I actually think Tertullian says that. Thank you. So how does um, Augustine respond, you know, without the Bible being readily accessible to just the everyday person? Um, in his sermons, how does he, like, reflect upon or preach the Bible knowing that maybe his congregants might not be exposed to it every day? Um, well, the, the Bible is is available. The question you're getting at, though, is like how many are able to, uh, to read and understand it? You know, there's a, there is a comment that John Chrysostom has where he announces the reading uh, for the following week, and he's encouraging then the patriarch of the extended household, assuming that he's assuming that person is literate, that they read the lesson so that there has been some reflection upon the lesson before they get to church. Um, I think that one of the things that characterizes uh, patristic preaching uh, to me, and it's something that I harp on a lot in class, uh, is their extensive use of Scripture in their preaching of Scripture. So it's not where we obviously are very scriptural when we're preaching whatever pericope we have. Well, they're using all of Scripture to preach that pericope. And so there, there's, there's, a, there's an element of biblical instruction and literacy that's cultivated simply by listening to preaching itself. Uh, so I think that's a big thing, right? I think that's, uh, it's, it's instructing them on what Scripture says, it's preaching a particular text, but then it's using all the time elements from the broader Scriptures that also then instructs people and teaches them uh, in the task of, of preaching. <laughs> 
One more? Was there uh, ever any instance where Augustine would have commented on his thoughts between like more doctrinal sort of preaching versus what might be considered like practical application considered, or if he even thought in those categories, or if he saw them as blended? Any reflections on that? Yeah, I think that I think generally speaking that that distinction is not readily seen. I mean, certainly Augustine has uh, more formal preaching again, in Carthage, or if he's preaching to the brethren, uh, to the monks. Um, but generally speaking, uh, there's a great deal of doctrine uh, in patristic preaching, uh, far more than, than we would see today. And, and oftentimes, I think sometimes you read it uh, and you're like, wow, <laughs> you know, how are you preaching on that? And for me, that's kind of more of an indictment to me. <laughs> like, why am I not preaching on that too, right? Um, I, I will say, here's, a, here's an element of Augustine's preaching I didn't mention, and this too surprises people. Augustine never assumes that everyone will understand his sermon. So Augustine never assumes that the task of preaching means that I somehow have to convey <clears throat> the text to everyone that's listening. He assumes that's not possible. Uh, and so another characteristic of his preaching is that he generally, toward the beginning of his sermons, especially if it's going to be a difficult exegetical text, that will involve Trinity or Christology or something like that, he will state the church's faith. And he does this all the time. You know, this is the faith of the church. This is what we believe. And then he will say, uh, if you cannot understand my exegesis, believe the faith of the church, right? And so he's assuming that there will be those who don't get what he's doing and don't understand. And he doesn't feel compelled to preach in such a way that the lowest common denominator or whatever uh, would understand. Uh, and I find that interesting because I think when we preach, we assume that, well, we have to preach in such a way that everyone understands, even though it's highly unlikely that that's happening, right? Uh, you've been to sermons yourself and you know that you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out, and then you piece that together and it's a different Bible altogether. Um, so that's where repetition comes in, and Augustine is often repetitive uh, in a good way in his preaching. But uh, yeah, there is a lot of doctrine in his preaching. 